you guys. So today we're going to be talking about fashion drawings. This is an extension on the other class of just regular human figure drawing. Um, we talked a little bit about how elongated fashion drawings are. They are, if you remember us talking about a head, a cannon, or a unit of measure, they are nine heads tall. Some designers will go as far to make them uh, 10 to 12 heads tall. I usually do nine. It's a little more realistic looking, um, but it still gives it that uh, a little a lengthened appearance. Um, even though it is ultimately that ninth head, that ninth unit of measure is taken up by the stilettos or high heels that they're usually wearing because when we're drawing a regular figure at eight heads tall, they're flat footed usually. And then when we draw a nine head croaky fashion drawing, we take up this entire bottom space with the length of their foot because they're wearing heels, right? Okay, so fashion drawings are called croquis, right? C-R-O-Q-U-I-S. And that is a French word for long ass human. So I don't really know what it means. So we're just going to pretend that that's what it means. All right, all I have is a regular piece of paper. You don't have to have this fancy paper. Um, the computer paper like we used last time is fine or anything that you prefer to sketch on. I have my regular pencil, not mechanical. If you have softer lead, use that. It's easier to um, get nice, confident, broader strokes without really digging into the paper with the harder graphite. And then I just have my uh, typical artist eraser right here. Again, like we did with the last exercise, I gave myself a template. This time I um, have 10 lines, horizontal lines, to give us those nine units of measurement. Um, so this drawing, when you're starting to sketch your croquis, uh, and hopefully this is interesting to everybody. Obviously this is uh, specific toward the fashion-oriented students, but when you're in design, you sort of need to know about everything. In every field, you have to let all disciplines inform you to be able to be a good designer. So whether you're interested in specific fashion drawing or not, you need to figure out how to be, or learn how to be um, excited about it or interested in it. Um, but at the very, very least, you might have some technical applications that you can use in other design fields as well. So let's start off just by doing our regular oval head in the very top unit in our head space number one. Right, simple oval. Um, and I'm going to do this drawing how I do it. Every designer comes up with their own unique style um, and then it usually progresses into their very uniquely stylized renderings. Um, I wouldn't say mine are particular, particularly stylized, but you, you probably will see a little bit of a, a uniqueness, I guess. Okay, so having said that, this is the way I go about drawing fashion designs. So like I said, we're going to start off in this first unit with an oval. We're going to come down with the uh, neck. Not too long. You don't want to make your uh, croquis look like giraffes. They still want to look like humans, but uh, just give yourself a little shape. Block it out like a neck would normally look, a little bit slimmer than the head. Now with fashion, it can be very stagnant. A lot of times with what they call technical flats, you're simply giving a design um, all of the detail and you want as much information as possible when you're drawing technical flats or things that are straightforward, straight on. 
Um, it's not about <clears throat> the mood or the feeling. You're not trying to catch the uh, fabrication and the characteristics of the fabrication, so it's very uh, stagnant. And in this case, we're going to do a pose that has a lot of movement in it because we will move into how to render fabric lightly. We're not going to go into that heavily, but it is sort of part part of the package when you're drawing for fashion. So movement, we need to, um, ha so how do we put movement into a drawing? Well, we learned that there are a few different principles, right, already, that pattern and rhythm and physical, um, literal, representations of movement can be used, but we are going to use movement um, through gesture. So we want our body to have um, its weight shifted in different directions. It's not all centered and balanced, right? And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to create an angle with her shoulders his or her shoulders, it doesn't have to be a woman when you're drawing this. I'm going to give one angle or one direction with the shoulders. And then when the human body um, makes that change in the pitch of your shoulders, it's always the opposite with the hips. So if I'm going to go this direction with my shoulders, let's say, I would make my spine follow right through the neck here, starting in the center of my shoulder line, and I would curve it down, curve it to the other side to give my hip that opposite angle. See how now my pelvic bone, my hips, are going in the opposite direction of my shoulders, right? Um, so if you remember where the crotch hits on a, a typical figure drawing, that is the middle of your template. Um, <clears throat> fashion drawings, and in this one, a nine head, I don't think this would um, apply to the 10 and 12 head methods, but in this nine head, since the last unit is taken up by the shoes, that's pretty much the only thing changing we're still going to have a template where the middle of your page or the middle of your map is going to be where the crotch falls, okay? So that fourth, the end of that fourth unit right here is where your crotch should end. And it can be about, around about. Remember that humans are very different. There are so many different sizes and shapes. Everything is not all uh, one size fits all. Um, so, we have now movement in the spine, this curve right here. We have a direction of the shoulders and the opposite direction of the hips. So we can now block out our pelvis bone. Remember that when a body, when a spine curves around like this, we have musculature over here that is condensed, and then this one is going to be elongated over here, obviously. Um, also remember that the line right above where our crotch hits, if this is our center, uh, so to say, right here where our crotch should hit, right above that, the line above it is where the navel is. And about where your navel is, is where the natural waist is. The natural waist is the smallest part of your waist. So you have a lower waist and then you know how you have pants or skirts that are high-waisted? That usually comes up to or close to your navel. Um, sometimes even past it, but it's just the very smallest part of your waist is the natural waist. So I want to uh, block out my torso simply. Remember how we are um, simplifying all shapes and lines. So I want to block out my torso with another trapezoid shape 
and I'm going to bring it into an angle that represents the smallest part of my waist, natural waist, okay? Okay, after you do that, you can from your hip line right here, decide what your legs are going to do. I'm gonna do a little bit sassy, a little bit of a sassy pose with this one. So I'm gonna give it a wide stance and it's gonna be a very strong stance. So I like to, um, like you, you could do, you could do a stance that was a little more demur, demure and a little more ladylike. Say you wanted to put all of her weight sort of centered and more um, a more refined look where she wasn't so uh, flamboyant, I guess. You could center all that weight on one leg and put it right below her head. All of that weight would center right here on this leg and then you could bring out this other one. So let's go ahead and do that, I guess. And the, the initial idea was that I would bring both legs out to be spread apart a little bit more than like a natural stance and it just gives it more attitude. And so that is one way to um, think about your, your poses when you're drawing fashion illustrations that should match the mood of your clothing and your inspiration. You don't want to have say a really a uh, demure, flowery print summer dress and the girl is looking like she's trying to be a badass in a really strong, fierce pose. You wanna sort of match up your poses so you have a unified feel or unified mood across the board. So consider that when you are um, trying to choose a pose to do, okay? Um, Okay, rather I'm just gonna stick with the initial. So we're gonna do the strong pose, but hopefully you understood what I was saying with if you put one leg right down the center underneath her head, that balances all of her weight on this one foot. So then she can kick this other leg out. Her hip is really cocked to one side. So she can kick this other leg out and sort of do whatever she wants with it. She could put it on the ball of her foot or put uh, her knee sort of up and bring uh, her foot all the way back in to her other leg. So if her, all of her weight is on that one leg, she has a lot of freedom to do whatever shape she wants to with the other leg. But for this one, we're gonna take this leg about right here and the other one about right there. Uh, with legs and when you have a fully like hyper extended leg where the joint cannot extend the the second part of the leg any further it's called hyper extended and you start to get this bend it's almost like a curve in the leg where the leg um, ultimately is straight but you do see a bit of a curve start to happen, especially because the muscle, the back muscle of the calf has more mass to it. So you start to see a curve going this way rather than the opposite direction of the thigh, right? Musculature is heavy on the top when it's the upper leg and then on the bottom when it's the lower leg. So keep that in mind when you're drawing legs also and you are you're uh, drawing very quickly just to give you yourself a, um, a, a better base to go off, I, I guess. Okay, so next I would just start to fill out, <clears throat> fill out the major shapes of this body. So I have two legs starting here. Here's the center of the crotch. I want to give a direction to my pelvis, okay? So if this is the waist right here, here's her hip. I want the front of her pelvis to be right here, okay? 
So these curves that I'm doing, you have to think about um, think about what the rest of her body is doing, what these shapes, um, I guess, I guess in relation to the legs, what are um, the roundness of the legs going to make happen to clothing? Like see how I'm curving it right here? That's because her thigh is round right there, okay? And notice that my uh, sketching is getting a little bit darker. You want to be a little soft at first so you can refine your drawing. You, um, you can tell when things start to come together that you might have made a, a line in a, in a wrong spot or slightly different space than you should have. See how I corrected myself right here? Um, once her pelvis was starting to come together, I could see that actually it would probably more look like this. So that's why I changed it to this line. And then I'll go back and erase that after. But so now I can start to see where this leg wants to go. Here's her knee. That's where that's going to end up. Probably a little bit higher actually. Um, because we want to account for those heels at the bottom, right? And then this one is going to be right there. And then this whole bottom down here is for her feet. So uh, there's another direction to consider. What direction are her feet? Um, this one is going to be slightly sideways and a little bit pointing to the front. Giving yourself medial lines for general shapes can really help you find the direction um, because if you're trying to draw a 3D object just, just from nothing, figuring out what, as you go, um, it's, it's very hard. But if you give yourself little uh, pieces of information that you gradually build from, then it makes things a little bit easier. It goes in the same vein as us talking about breaking things down into an equation. Let's talk about the components that make up what we're trying to get to. What are the unknown factors that equal what we want? Figure out those factors and then, then we make it happen. And that's the way we're sort of breaking this down. Um, into smaller shapes and simplified uh, lines, directions, angles, relation and perspective. Um, how do things look com in relation to other things? Okay, next I want to give myself um, some arms and I'm just doing the base of my arms here uh, so I can get the overall gesture, finish the pose off. Uh, remember that the elbow lines up about with your natural waist. If you are sitting or standing right now and you put your elbows directly against your side, you will find that your elbow pretty much lines up with the, the smallest part of your waist. And these types of observations can be applied to any of your figure drawings. Look at your own body. Look at other people's bodies. Uh, not in a weird way, just do it uh, for research, right? Uh, so take note of these things and that's what informs your future drawings. You can say, if her shoulder is going to start right here, then I should stop her upper part of her arm about right here. And you might say, why would you stop it here? Her waist is at line four right here. Uh, it's because the angle of her shoulders is pulling one side up further. So that means this lower shoulder over here is going to allow her elbow to land a little bit lower on this side, lower than her natural waist. See what I'm doing? See what I mean? Okay, so let's decide what her arms are going to do first off. Um, I'll probably put... Uh, I'll 
make this arm uh, pretty relaxed and casual uh, down by her side. But this one is going to be uh, bent and then I guess come out from her side like this. Okay. All right. So we want to get rid of this really sharp trapezoid shape right here because that does not look human at all. Um, that could be the shape of a blazer, like a very structured silhouette, but we are trying to get the body down first. Okay, remember right here at the bottom of the neck and where the shoulder line is, we have a super sternal notch where it um, it's in the direct center of the body and it is um, in between your collarbones. So right here, I like to um, use this space to block out her shoulders and I use the collarbone, the line of the collarbone to follow that up to her shoulders. I usually have a more squared shape with my shoulders. I don't know why it gets angular like that. It always has been. It's just how I do it. And like I said, you'll usually see something and in a second you'll be like, mm, that should probably look a little different. I'm gonna change it up. And that usually is what happens with my own drawings for sure. Okay, let's block out the breast. We'll say sort of right about there and right about there. And right now, I just want to give myself the lines of a softer body. We have all these blocked out shapes that are very angular, but now I can use those as my base and um, now fill it in with softer shapes and curves that more represent a realistic body. So uh, you know that you have that rib cage ending about right here and it might sink in a little bit at your natural waist and then come right back out for your hip. I'm gonna give her legs some more shape. Remember that you have more muscle and more fat on the inside of your thigh and it goes in very uh, sort of very slender when it gets close to the knee and then for the knee joint it comes back out just a little bit. The very top of your thigh tends to have this arch especially if you're very muscular and then it also goes back in when it gets close to the knee and then comes back out for the actual knee. And then uh, using that technique I was talking about with giving yourself a medial line, a line for the center of your object, I can use that uh, when I'm doing the legs to get where the shapes should be and where the um, curves should be because uh, the musculature of the body, if you're looking at a leg at different angles, you're going to see some spots are flat and if you turn it a little bit, it might have more of a curve to it. So that medial line, like I'm doing here with the calf, this is the center of her leg and it's going to meet up with the center of her foot right here. So now I can say, okay, this is almost a three quarter turn of a calf. I would see just a little bit of this muscle on the outside happening, but not much. And then I would bring it right back into the ankle. The ankle gets very small and then the arch of the foot is going to have a curve outward out like that.
again with the calves, you um, have two different curves happening. On the inside of the calf, the curve starts higher and is bigger. So it's small right under the knee because it's coming from that joint right there. And then it uh, starts pretty quickly to uh, have a mass of muscle right there and then comes back down uh, higher than the outside. The outside has a longer, more uh, subtle curve. So now I'm going to do that same thing for this side. I'm going to give myself a little more muscle, fatty area on the inside of the thigh, come toward the center right before the knee, block out a little uh, joint for the knee. And when you're doing these sketches, loosen up. If you feel like your arm is very tense and your muscles are tight, it um, is hard for you to adapt to what your mind is telling your hand to do. If your muscles are already in the route, they're doing one, uh, they're making a line and they're already in sort of the progression of it, it's hard to change it if your muscles are very tense. Make sure you pay attention to that and loosen them up, stretch them out, and let your hand be able to um, make quick changes, what your brain is telling your hand to do. Okay, so I'm giving myself another medial line for her uh, foot over here and her calf. And this foot I'm gonna do a little different. Since this leg is turned at an angle that is straighter, more straight on than this leg, I'm going to make her foot turn in a little bit. Give it like a little sassy turn. So this is almost straight on her calf. And in that case, we would see a subtle line right here. And then a more muscular, muscular, or a more curvy shape on the inside, like we just talked about for the other leg. And because her foot is turned in that way a little bit, you will see some of her heel. Okay, and really, um, this is more detail than a lot of fashion illustrators would give. You don't want to draw a bunch of um, lines, way more information than you need, and then cover it up with an outfit just to erase it later. So normally you would give yourself a very minimal base to work off your croquis template, draw the most important thing, which is the outfit that you're trying to illustrate, and then fill in the rest of the body um, as you need it. Um, but since this is a, a learning purpose, we're going a little bit more with it. With the arms, remember that you have a uh, somewhat bigger muscle up here at the shoulder and it comes in a little bit, it gets a little bit straight. If you're uh, a female, well I guess males too, even though they're mu more muscular in general, the arm tends to come back in. If you're looking at it from straight on, the arm gets a little more slender in the center and then comes back out for the elbow joint and then you have a forearm that's a typical everybody knows what a forearm does 
and then pretty universally or unanimously uh, people agree that hands are the hardest to draw so I don't know what to tell you that's just practice right there that gives you the ability to do that so study anatomy and practice if you want to draw good hands this arm is pretty much filled out already okay so this is our body we have everything mapped out except for her face and with this we could do a uh, look straight on which would probably be good if she wanted to look over this way we would make the curve go this way if she were looking the other way just the opposite but let's make her looking straight on so we're just going to give a cross right in the middle of her head and that would be our placement for our eyes and she would be ready for the finishing features of her face. Um, obviously, humans don't have a, an egg head like that, so we would block out her jaws and give her a hairline. Let's just go simple. And let's give her a little uh, dress just to uh, just to illustrate how fabric looks when you're drawing motion uh, for fashion. Okay, so let's just do a little spaghetti strap um, for the straps. It's really easy to draw a dress and have the straps look just a little bit off. This is where lining things up and using perspective helps so much. If you were having a cross back strap situation in the back, I've seen so many illustrations that use that style and when they cross it in the back in their illustration, it's very off center. Like it would be over here where the cross meets each other, what you need to do is go back to that medial line that we've been talking about, find the center, whether it's the front or back, the center of anything that you're working with, find the true center of that, and that's where you would make the straps crisscross. It's gonna make your drawings look so much better, more realistic, just more believable. Um, and I brought that up because the front part of the straps, uh, these can actually vary. It's arbitrary to the designer of the dress how far apart they want the straps. That's actually a designing technique to make shoulders look smaller or bigger. When you have a halter top, a shirt that comes uh, covers the breast area and then comes all the way around her neck, that's a halter top. Her shoulders are completely bare, but it has an effect on the shoulders that's very broadening. So uh, for a person that has broader shoulders and doesn't want to um, focus on that, uh, they would not want to wear a halter top. So designers have that ability to make decisions like that that uh, have an effect, uh, sort of an optical illusion on the viewer, okay? So wherever your design puts their straps, make sure that you are intentional with that. Like we could have straps closer to the outside of her arm. We could have straps that came right to the side of her neck, maybe even tied around her neck, just like a halter would. Um, but we're gonna do very central, centered uh, straps and visualize where that would fall you want it to come down right to the center of the apex or the highest point of the breast, okay? And let's give it 
uh, just a V uh, neckline and again I am finding the center of her and I'm bringing that V to meet that okay now usually the center would correspond with this spine the line right here that I made but we've changed the direction of her torso just because it fit better with everything else so that can change as well um, everything is pretty much fluid the end game of all of this is just to have an interesting, compelling, uh, good-looking illustration, right? So unless you're trying to uh, demonstrate or illustrate something that is uh, ultra-realistic or trying to portray something that's factual, then uh, it doesn't really matter as long as it looks realistic and believable and it has style and it keeps people interested so I don't know why I got off on that tangent but there you go so now we're gonna bring this side and if we had a dress like this it would probably be a pretty thin um, some fabric that had a more flexible silky hand to it and when I say hand, it means the feel of a fabric, literally the hand of it. Um, so it would have a drape that was clingy. It has a lot of movement to it. There's not a lot of rigidity to it. There's no structure really. Um, so it would fall. It would uh, fall on the body and uh, it would not create any volume on its own, right? So. Pretty much the shape of the body is going to be what you would see over or underneath the fabric. Um, now a big thing with fabric is the wrinkles where the fabric folds over on each other. Uh, so think about how the body is uh, posed or the position of the body because her waist over here is uh, more crunched in. I would say the fabric would pile a little bit right here on itself so I would give a couple sweeping lines like this just to demonstrate that the fabric has piled a little bit right here on this side of the hip where it's cocked further out. Um, and then it would continue to drop down her leg. Uh, with this position and movement of this particular body uh, you have to decide if the skirt is uh, flowing in the air is she twisting is she just moving back and forth what is the sweep of her skirt doing and almost always the skirt the fabric of the skirt or dress is going to move with whichever um, side is like you would think that the fabric would go with this side with her hip that's cocked out, but it actually would go with this side because her hip out like this means that she just changed weight, shifted weight from this leg to this leg, meaning she is moving this way, right? She's moving from right to left and that means the fabric is going to follow her from right to left and the fabric is going to trail behind her. So while this side is tight clinging to her body because she's going in that direction, right? This side would be swung out like this.
and I'm giving the dress a little high-low hem. So you see these um, sort of waves that I put in the hem of her skirt, the sweep of her skirt. This is a flouncing effect that um, just lets the viewer know that there's extra fabric there. It's not pulled taut. It's sort of flowing and has ripples in it. Um, it's the same technique you would use to illustrate uh, frilly, um, what am I trying to say, gathers, tucks, or pleats, right? You would have a fabric fold over on itself and then you'd give it a little line to indicate that's a an edge. Um, okay, that's pretty much it. Other than fabrication, um, um, it is important to practice this. It's not easy to just right off the bat understand where your um, lines of fabric detail should go. But the more you practice, the more you study fabrics and see what they actually do in real life, uh, the more it, easier it becomes for you. For jeans, think about how the wearer, um, right at the top of the legs, it usually bunches up a little bit, right? You have some crease lines. So I normally on one side would give a crease line right at the crotch at the top of the thigh. Um, just think about stuff like that. And then you can definitely use shadows, shading and highlight to uh, indicate that happening as well. You don't have to give yourself hard lines right there. But at this point, I would take a black pen. I would go over all the lines that I want to keep and then I would erase all of my sketchier lines, right? And then when you want to start coloring it in, gouache is great for that. Watercolors like we've been using is great for that. I used to use markers a lot of the time, Prismacolor markers, because you can layer them and really build them up. You can blend the colors. Um, you can blend the colors right on the paper or even together with a colorless blender. You can add colors together even like a uh, on a palette, a plastic palette, just like watercolors work. Um, so Prismacolors are a really great way to go. Uh, you can build up shadow just by doing this a same second layer of that, that same color. So if you're trying to get into this field um, definitely practice all you can observe everything about fabric about anatomy and then get some quality coloring um, methods whether it's markers uh, crayons that are you know the the water soluble crayons uh, gouache is great it's the one that's a little more pigmented in pigmented than watercolors, but you should definitely test out what works for you and go with that. Okay, this is just an extension on last class, so there's no assignment tied with this, just the earlier one, the exercise on proportion with the regular human figure drawing, um, and then the two freestyle um, exercises of the images that I provided to you on Blackboard. Okay, you guys, I'll see you soon.